Thank you, Wendy. And thank you to all the groups. And uh, again, thank you to Councilmember Tom Hucker for engaging with the groups to come up with the idea for today's forum. And salute to my council colleagues for their ongoing leadership on the environment. And uh, looking forward to the continuing discussion here and, and recommendations about what this county can be doing to improve our environmental policy. Um, it is a very tough time in this country on the environment. We are seeing all around us, unfortunately, tragically, precisely what was predicted 20, 30, 50 years ago. You know, we have half the state of California in flames. We have waterways that are, you know, so degraded. We have summers that have become so hot, they, they, they seem unbearable. You know, I, I, I now regularly think to myself that we have ruined summer for our children's children. And that's just, uh, we had no right to do that, you know. And of course, when I say we, I mean, I guess I mean, I mean certain leaders in this country, those of us in this room have known what needs to be done and have, have done everything that we could to push for that. But unfortunately, you know, our federal government has been slow to act and has often been captured by the fossil fuel industry. And we're doing everything we can to push back against that and to try to keep in power individuals who are willing to make the right decisions. But uh, it, it is devastating. Remember the movie Inconvenient Truth? That was 18 years ago. Can you believe that? 18 years ago. In a way, it feels like yesterday because it still has such a, a resonance, such a powerful impact you know, on the consciousness of the country. But in these 18 years, has, has enough changed? Of course not. You know, of course not. And sadly, you know, due to the vagaries or the unpredictabilities of electoral politics, we now have a president who openly campaigned on restoring fossil fuel production and burning coal once again and rolling back the Obama administration's significant gains. And that's, it's hard to watch, I know. Um, what we really need, we want, we're here today to talk about local leadership. I think we all know what really is going to solve the problem is federal, state, and local leadership of government combined with individual action and the private sector, everybody working together. That's the only real way we're going to actually solve the problem. And of course, you know, the tone comes from the top. So who's, who's the president makes a huge difference. And to see this president pull out of the climate accord, roll back the uh, the par pull out of the Paris Accord, roll back the clean power plant, um, make solar energy more expensive. The list is long. So into the breach, you know, we are going to do everything we can. I guess what I would like to say about your council is we're willing to do any policy. We're going to craft it in a, in a responsible way, in a balanced way, but we're willing to consider any policy and we're willing to enact anything that is going to move the ball forward and is within our legitimate authorities and you know, is, a, is, a, is a realistic approach. Um, I think we have been leaders in many ways, but we have a lot to do. There's no question about it. So the value of today's discussion and this process is bring us your ideas. Tell us where we can go to lead. You know, let's work together in partnership. That's, that's the opportunity to make something happen is by working together. But we've got to get this conversation focused at the local level on the issues that really matter. Smart growth, my friends, that's what we can do. That is one of the two or three most important policy areas for local government is smart growth. That means putting the future population growth through housing around public transportation. You know, if you're not in favor of smart growth, you know, we need, to, we need to have a, a talk <laughs> because the alternative to smart growth is sprawl. It's chewing up the agricultural reserve. It's, it's housing developments in Frederick County where people sit on 270 for an hour emitting pollution all the way to their jobs in Rockville, Bethesda, or Washington, D.C. But you know, I think smart growth is one of the hardest things for local governments to do because smart growth requires change. It requires change in the communities around us. And 
You know, one of my favorite sayings that uh, another local official told me was that people demand progress, but they oppose change. <laughs> that's, that's our challenge in a nutshell, right? Everybody wants us to solve the climate crisis, but not everybody is willing to accept the kind of change it's going to take in our daily lives. And we know that there are many, many t types of changes. We should eat less meat. We should walk more. You know, we should take public transportation more. One of the other changes is accepting that more housing in our urban centers near public transportation is the way for us to grow in a reasonable way. We know the population's going to grow. We know people are going to continue to have babies. No one's proposing to do anything about that. So as long as we're willing to accept that, we've got a plan for the future. So you now let's work together to support housing in our transit centers and walkable communities. You know, we've had some big victories. The Purple Line, that's a huge victory for the environment. Funding Metro. <laughs> Funding Metro. That is a huge victory for the environment. Getting Metro back as a reliable transportation choice. And look what we can do with those kind of plans. Look at the Bethesda Master Plan that we passed, where we are working towards the goal, and it's going to be a requirement for new development, that about half of all the trips that are generated, whether a person coming to work or a person living in a, in a, in a, in a building, have to be non-driving. You know, and we can actually put requirements into the development process and then work with property owners to ensure that that is achieved. That is how you move the needle, reducing auto trips, which reduces pollution into the environment. Around you here in Silver Spring, you've, you can see the, the bike lanes that we've built, the protected bike lane network. I'll tell you, a test of our county's leadership will be, is that bike lane network complete? Right now, it's about halfway there. And we've got some tough decisions to make to complete that loop. So next year or two years from now, whenever we're supposed to be done with that, we'll, we'll, we'll have a report card to very visibly understand whether we are actually taking local leadership on smart growth and alternative transportation. Clean power, Eric Kaufman in the back, you know, working with so many people in our community. Hi, Nancy Fleury. Nancy has arrived. Eric Kaufman has been helping us figure out just about you know, everything that we can do. A few years ago, Montgomery County government, as I'm sure you know, became 100% powered by clean, renewable energy. All of our government operations, the lights in this building, but actually, we are, we are carbon neutral even when you add up our fleet. Um, you know, everything that we use energy to do, Montgomery County government operations are carbon neutral. So that's, that's you know, that's something, right? What we really, of course, need to do is get the private sector towards something similar, and we expressed our support for that goal with the resolution that we passed. But, you know, we have recently passed zoning changes to support community solar. I think we need to look at how to have more solar in our farmland communities. You know, there's real opportunities for community solar, and we have to accept our local responsibility around solar power production. So this September, we're going to have a full council discussion. I think it's in September. Um, around the climate report. I really want to applaud the executive branch working with the community to develop a climate action report. And we'll take that up at the council and figure out what we need to do, what we can do, and how to keep it moving. I think that's the first question is, how do we keep this moving? You know, we need to ensure that, like we had a sustainability plan a number of years ago that gave us a roadmap, and then we tried to enact just about everything we could from that. You know, this initiative needs to provide the same kind of tool set where it's an ongoing dialogue, we have a real clear set of recommendations, and then we can work together to ensure that we uh, implement that. So that's going to be the job for the fall to figure out how to take that next step. And uh, now it's my opportunity to introduce Patty Bubar. And Patty, I've gotten to know uh, working hard on the stormwater infrastructure changes. And that was a real challenge. You know, we worked it through together. We got something done, and uh, I think everyone showed a lot of, you know, a lot of grit through that process. Um, so Patty has been deputy director of our county's Department of Environmental Protection and the acting director since December. Patty oversees the policy and direction for the county's environmental programs, and that includes residential trash and recycling collection services and disposal, 
That's a big one, right? We want to get towards zero waste. We want to get towards you know, composting. And uh, ultimately, we'd like to shut down the Dickerson power plant, of course. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, the, the incinerator, I should say, the power plant's barely operating, I understand. But the incinerator, in order to do that, we've got to be able to divert you know, a, a, a much larger share of our waste than we do. So we have a long way to go in order to achieve that. But Patty's work at the Department of Environmental Protection overseeing that program is really essential. Uh, working on water quality and stormwater management and ensuring that the county environmental ordinances are enforced. Um, a few years ago, we passed a ban of styrene for takeout food containers. And uh, what wasn't really well understood at the time is that that ban also covers straws. So you're hearing a lot about straw bans right now. Well, we've actually already done that. Um, we just haven't really told the world about it yet. And so we're going to be doing that. Patty has uh, recently advised us you know, that she concurs with our interpretation that that, that law uh, does, in fact, cover straws. So um, we've got a job to do in the next couple months to kind of get the word out that takeout straws uh, are, I think it's just takeout straws, or is it any straw? Takeout straws are, you know, in violation of the ordinance. So um, that will be something we'll be working on. Um, Patty's also a board member of the, the Green Bank, and um, that helps provide low-cost financing for clean energy projects. Not a lot of local governments have created a Green Bank. You know, Montgomery County did create one. We got some money out of the settlement with Exelon, I think, to fund that. Um, and before coming to the county a few years ago, Patty worked for the US EPA, the Department of Energy, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, Regulatory Commission, working on energy and environmental policy issues. She graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a degree in civil engineering, focusing on environmental engineering, and she's a recipient of the Presidential Meritorious Rank Award and the Distinguished Career Service Award. So without further ado, Patty Bubar. <laughs> 